Hey guys, welcome back. We'll continue with the book Cracking Codes with Python. And in this video, we're going to cover a new way to encrypt messages using the Affine cipher. Let's get right into it. Let's write a program that can encrypt and decrypt a message using the Affine cipher. And to follow along, you can head over to inventwithpython.com. The link is also in the description down below. Now to get started, we can open up idle and then create a new file which we can save as affinecipher.py. Now to start out with, we are going to import four different modules. We need the system module in order to exit our program. We need the piperclip module to copy texts, for example, our encrypted message. And we can then use that to easily paste it, for example, into an email. We are also importing the cryptomath module, which we wrote in the last video. And we use that to compute the greatest common divisor and also to calculate the modular inverse. And then we also need the random module. Just as with the Caesar cipher, we are then defining a list of different symbols, similar to our cipher wheel. So the letters A to Z, uppercase and lowercase, as well as the numbers one through nine and zero, the space character, exclamation mark, question marks, and period character. And then we start out with our main function. Here we have the message that we want to decrypt. And after that, we have the key that we use to encrypt or decrypt our message, and we can specify the mode. So in this case, encrypt, but we could also set that string to decrypt in order to decrypt an encrypted message. Now, if we set the my mode variable to encrypt, we're then going to call the encrypt message function, passing the key that we specified and our message that should be encrypted as arguments to it. And the encrypt message function is defined down below. Otherwise, if we set my mode to decrypt, then we're going to decrypt our message, again, passing my key and my message as arguments to that function. For clarity, we're then printing out the key that we're using. So in our case, this key up here. We're also printing if we are encrypting or decrypting a message by using my mode, whatever we specified here, and calling title on it in order to capitalize the first letter. And then we're printing out the encrypted or decrypted message, depending on which mode we selected. And we are also going to copy that message using our Piperclip module and the copy function so that we can easily paste it, for instance, into a different file. And to notify the user, we are also going to print out that the encrypted or decrypted text has been copied to the clipboard and can therefore be easily pasted. Now, in order to encrypt or decrypt our messages inside of our main function, we of course specify separate functions to either encrypt or decrypt the message. And those functions take the key that we specified as well as the message that we defined. Now, since we're using the Affine cipher, we need basically two different keys. One key to use for multiplication using the multiplicative cipher, and then one key to shift the position on the cipher wheel, similar to the Caesar cipher. And those different keys are stored in key A and key B. And in order to derive them from the key that we specified, we have a separate function called get key parts. And get key parts takes the key in our program as an argument. And then we get back key A by using integer division, by dividing our key by the number of symbols that we specified. So in our case, symbols has a total of 66 different characters. And if we take our key of 2894, and we perform an integer division by the size of the symbols, so 66 characters, we would get a value of 43 for key A. And then for key B, we're going to take our key and we're calculating the remainder by using the modular operator on the length of the symbols. So for our key, 2894 modulo 66, the size of our symbols constant, we would get a value of 56. And once we calculated key A and key B, we are returning it and we are returning it using a tuple. We haven't seen tuples before yet, but we're gonna do a little deep dive a little bit later. But basically a tuple is very similar to a list, but it cannot be modified. So we can return multiple values, in this case here two separate keys, but the tuple itself cannot be modified. Now once we get that value back inside of our encrypt function, we are storing it in key A and key B. And then we are checking if those keys, key A and key B, for encryption here are valid. 
because there are some keys that can be insecure. So in our check keys function, we're taking the two keys and also the mode, whether we encrypt or decrypt a message. So we are checking the different conditions. If key A has a value of one and we're trying to encrypt a message, then we're going to exit the program with a message that the cipher is weak. If key A has a value of one, then we should choose a different key. And the reason for that is that we're going to multiply whatever index our letter has by key A. And of course, any number multiplied by one is the same number. So it's a very insecure key. And we're also checking if key B, the key that we use for addition later on to basically shift after the multiplication has a value of zero. Because of course, if key B has a value of zero, then we're basically not shifting the index. So again, that would be an insecure key. And we're also checking for two additional conditions. So if key A is less than zero or key B is less than zero, or if key B is greater than the length of the symbol minus one, we are also going to exit. And finally, we are checking if the greatest common divisor of key A and the size of our symbols is not equal to one. And that's of course because we need to make sure that those two values are relatively prime to each other. So in that case, the greatest common divisor between the two should be one. If that's not the case, they are not relatively prime and therefore they're not secure. So in any of those four conditions, we would exit our program. But if all of these four conditions are all right, then we're going to define an empty string called ciphertext. And we're going to loop over every single symbol in our message. And if our symbol is contained in our symbols constant, then we're going to encrypt the character. For that, we're going to find the position of that specific symbol inside of our symbols constant. And then we're going to multiply the symbol index with key A. And after that, we're going to add key B to it to shift the value. And in order to make sure that we don't run out of the bounds of our symbols constant, we're then going to use a modular operator and use it with the length of the symbols. And that is going to be added to our ciphertext. If instead the character is not inside of the symbols constant, then we are simply going to add the symbol to the end of our ciphertext. And at the end of it, we are going to return our ciphertext. Now, if instead we are using our program to decrypt a message, we again accept the key and the message as arguments. And we're using the get key parts function, passing the key to it to get two keys, key A and key B that we're gonna use. We're then again checking our keys to see if they're valid. And we're defining the plain text as an empty string. Now we need to use the find modular inverse function that we specified in the last episode. And we're passing key eight and the length of our symbols constant as arguments to that function. And that's going to return the modular inverse of key A that we need. And after that, we are going to loop through all the different symbols in our encrypted message again. We are checking if that symbol is in our symbols constant. And if it is, we are getting the index by using the find function, passing the symbol as an argument to it. And then in order to get the plain text character, we are taking the symbol index that we determined, we are subtracting key B and multiply that by the modular inverse of key eight. We then use the modular operator with the length of the symbols to make sure that we stay within the constraints. And of course, we're using that value to reference the correct symbol inside of our symbols constant. And we're adding that to the plain text. And just with our encrypt message function, we are also covering the case that a symbol is not inside of our symbols constant. In that case, we are simply adding the symbol itself to the end of our plain text. And at the end, of course, we're returning the decrypted message. We also have one additional function here, get random key, and we can use that to come up with a random but valid key that we can use. And that can be useful because coming up with a random key that's also valid, so that matches all the requirement of our check keys function can be difficult, and therefore we're using a while loop. Here we are defining key eight by getting a random number between two and the length of our symbols constant and a random key B by getting a random integer between, again, two and the length of the symbols. And then we still need to make sure that our greatest common divisor between key A and the length of the symbols is equal to one, meaning that they are relatively prime to each other. And only if that's the case, we're going to return the key by using key A, multiplying it by the length of the symbols and adding key B to it. And of course, if this condition here is not true, so if the greatest common divisor of key A and the length of the symbols constant is not equal to one, we are simply going to keep on looping until we find a valid key. And at the very end, of course, we need to make sure that we set our if statements here correctly so that 
so that name is equal to the string main and that in that case the main function is run so that we can run our program under the name affinecipher.py. So let's run our program and let's have a look at the result. So we can see our key is printed out and we can see our encrypted text and the message is also copied to the clipboard so we could paste it into some other file for example. We also learned about the tuple data type before and in order to define a tuple data type we're using parentheses rather than square brackets as we would with lists and then we simply type in the values. Let's say we have a keys tuple with the values 23 and 58 and similar as with lists we can reference those values by simply referencing their index and we're gonna get back those values. For example the value at index 1 or the value at index 0 but in contrast to lists we are not able to make any changes to it. So if we try to update the first value here for example to a value of 12 we're gonna get a type error message because the tuple object does not support item assignment. So tuples are always useful when we have a collection of different values and we want to make sure that those values cannot be changed. So in our example of working with two keys A and B we don't want them to be changed during the run of our program and therefore we can use the tuple data type. So now that we wrote our program to encrypt or decrypt a message using the Fiend cipher, we want to know how secure this encryption method actually is. And as we know, we should always assume that an attacker would know all the information about our encryption method except for the key. So for example, the size of the symbol that we are using, the only thing that's unknown is the key. So therefore the question is how many keys can the Affine cipher actually have? And to calculate that, let's actually create a new program. We're going to save it under the name affinekeytest.py and let's have a look at the number of possible keys. We already know that the second key that we're using to basically shift on the cipher wheel is limited to the size of characters. So in our case 66. But we could assume that key A that we use for multiplication can be as large as we want so long as it's relatively prime. But to check that we can write this program here and here we are importing our affine cipher module that we just wrote and also the cryptomath module from the last episode. We then use a test message here that we want to encrypt and for key A we are going to loop from the range of 2 to 80. We know that we can't use a key of 1 that's invalid because every number multiplied by 1 would be the same number and we also cannot use a value of 0 because of course any value multiplied by zero would be zero. So again, that wouldn't be secure. And then to determine the key, we're going to use key A and we are multiplying it by the length of our symbols. And to keep key B constant, we are just going to set it to a value of one. So therefore key B will be one and we're just adding one to the end of it. And then of course we still need to check that the key A that we used as well as the length of our symbols are relatively prime to each other. So therefore it's the greatest common divisor is equal to one. And if that's the case, we're going to print out key A as well as the encrypted message. So let's run our program and let's have a look at the results. And here we can see the different valid keys that can be used that are relatively prime. But if we have a closer look, we can see that some of the messages that we encrypt with different keys, for example, with key five and key 71 actually result in the same message. So this message up here is the same as this one down here. And the same is true for key seven and key 73 as well as for key 13 and key 79. In fact if we take key 71 and we subtract 5 from it which has the same key we get the value 66 which is exactly the size of our symbols. So therefore we realize that with key A that we are using the same thing happens as with key B. The encrypted output repeats itself or wraps around every 66 keys. So when we multiply 66 as the possible numbers of keys for key A by 66 again, which is a possible number of values for key B, we get a value of 4,356. But we also know that for key A, valid keys need to be relatively prime to the size of the message. So therefore we actually don't have 66 values here. But in fact, if we were to count the different keys that are possible, starting from a key of five, until that repeats itself with key 71, we get a total of 20 values that are valid. So therefore the actual number of possible keys would be 20 times 66, which is 1,320. So therefore we would only need to try out 1,320 keys in order to break our message. 
and therefore we realize that the Affine cipher is also not very secure. So therefore we still need to find a more secure way to encrypt or decrypt our messages. So let's have a look at the practice questions. And the first question is, the Affine cipher is a combination of which two other ciphers? So we know that we take two steps with the Affine cipher. We first multiply the index by a certain key, our key A, and then we shift the result by a certain number of positions using key B. And that's a combination of the multiplicative cipher as well as the Caesar cipher, which is also called the shift cipher. What is a tuple? How is a tuple different from a list? So a tuple is a data type that can contain other values just as a list, but in contrast to a list, its values are immutable and therefore cannot be changed. The next question is, if key A is 1, why does it make the affine cipher weak? So we learned that if key 1 of our affine cipher is set to a value of 1, then we are multiplying the index of our original message by key A. And of course, every value multiplied by 1, it's going to be the same value. So therefore, it is not secure. And finally, the last question, if key B is 0, why does it make the affine cipher weak? So we know that we add key B after we multiply the original index by key A, and then we add key B to it. So if key B is set to 0, then we're not shifting the index of that number. So any number plus 0 is, of course, still the same number. So therefore, the affine cipher would encrypt a letter to that same letter. And that, of course, is not secure. We covered how we can write a program to encrypt a message using the affine cipher. In the next video, we are going to learn how we can brute force that cipher. Feel free to subscribe to the channel to stay up to date and see you guys in the next video.